Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Simon Shaw. Um, I've been with InterSystems for uh, more than 15 years now. Uh, I joined as a sales engineer, and then I transitioned to um, uh, implementation, then to development. I got sent down to the country of Chile to uh, write object script in Spanish, and that was a very interesting experience. Um, but then I transitioned back to sales engineering, so <clears throat> it was like running around a big circle. Um, so today we're going to have a great presentation um, from one of our long-term customers, um, Northwell Health. We have a guest speaker, Kyle Baxter. Um, he's the senior database architect that, um, uh, from Northwell, but he cannot make it in person because of uh, family obligations, so, but he's live on Teams. Um, so uh, today, Kyle, Kyle and I, we're going to talk about um, the journey that the Northwell Analytics team took to migrate the entire um, analytics workflow to, from uh, Microsoft SQL Server to Iris. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, challenges they faced at the beginning of the migration and how they overcame these challenges um, by leveraging some of the uh, SQL <clears throat> Sorry. SQL optimization techniques. Um, so part one, I'll talk about the migration, the history, and part two, uh, Kyle will take you uh, into a <clears throat> technical deeper dive. So have you guys heard about Northwell Health? No, okay. But you have seen this image, right? This is the first time that the, uh, <clears throat> the COVID-19 uh, vaccine was injected into the arm of the Northwell nurse, and uh, that was this particular image that gave us great hope um, since the uh, beginning of the pandemic. So Northwell Health is New York's largest private employer and healthcare, healthcare provider with 22 hospitals and more than 830 outpatient facilities. And they also, uh, they've been a partner of and customer of InterSystems for more than a decade. They're also the early adopter of the InterSystems HealthShare uh, platform, Unified Care Record, uh, to integrate dozens of the disparate data sources, and uh, that enables them to improve care qualities and outcomes and to identify cohorts for population health and clinical trials and manage risks. And you can see that they're all over New York. So let me talk a little bit about the background of this migration. At the beginning, uh, that was a few years ago, Northwell was dissatisfied with the uh, <clears throat> version 1503 Health Insight to, uh, uh, for analytics platform. And they then installed SQL Server um, and started pumping data out of Health Insight to uh, send to Microsoft SQL Server to create a usable analytics platform. However, the performance problem persisted the, uh, the queries were running really slow, if not timing out, and the, uh, the system required a frequent reboot, and it was really disrupt disruptive to the analytics workflow. So the inner systems created the first shard cluster, Iris shard cluster, in the lab environment um, with a copy obtained, uh, of the Health Insight database obtained from Northwell. And there was a, a series of performance comparisons between Iris and SQL Server. Um, as you can see, uh, there's some of the statistics we collected on the right-hand side. Um, so throughout, throughout these drag races, Iris pr pretty much won every single battle. Well, except the uh, query number five. So <laughs> almost. Um, so with those test results, uh, Northwell decided to decommission SQL Server and migrate the entire analytics workload to uh, Iris. And the Iris shard cluster was de deployed uh, in multiple environments from dev to QA to stage and to prod. And finally, they went live with Iris um, about six months ago. So it was really a monumental task because it involved hundreds of queries and store procedures that are used in um, some of the data extraction jobs including ClinicThink and Javion. I'll cover these two in a minute. And uh, they were also used in the Python scripts and most importantly, Power BI reports and dashboards. 
And they were originally written in SQL Server, and they had to convert it to Iris SQL. Although Iris stand, uh, supports standard SQL, there are still some differences in syntax. Uh, but more importantly, they had to be enhanced for faster performance. So let me talk a little bit about these data extraction jobs. Um, so what's clinic think? This is to extract clinical documents from the HIE uh, HealthShare to ClinicThink leveraging their AI and NLP capabilities um, for analysis of un unstructured data. And JVN is to uh, leverage their AI software to um, analyze factors that contribute to the likelihood of readmission or avoidable ad admission. So they were implemented as business service and operations in uh, iris interoperability production. Um, as you can see, the, uh, this, the data load trigger that triggers the execution of the backend SQL queries, and the result sets got sent externally to um, ClinSync and JVL. So at the beginning of the migration, the team faced many uh, performance-related challenges. Um, here's the list of some of the jobs that were to be migrated, migrated including uh, ClinSync, JVM, and as you can see, a lot of them had performance problems. So between InterSystem and Noswell, we uh, set up bi-weekly workshops to attack these slow performance problems. Uh, the team would bring up a slow query, we'll analyze it, we'll take it apart, and we'll um, try various uh, SQL optimization techniques to make it run faster. So at the end of the, uh, these workshops, uh, the, the, um, the, the team was able to complete the entire migration project within deadline, and this was announced as a major accomplishment in Northwell's quarter one uh, planning meeting. So how much data are we talking about here? A quick glimpse into the row counts of these tables reveal that this is really analytics at scale. Um, some of these tables are so large, they exceed billions of rows. As you can see, um, observation has 2.4, and lab result item has almost 1.6. So that comes to the total of 6.7 billion data elements. What about the size of the databases? Um, in this four node uh, shard cluster, Data is equally divided, uh, distributed across four shard nodes. In shard one, there's almost 1.6 terabytes, 1.68 in shard two, 1.67 in shard four. That comes to a total of 6.68 terabytes. That's a lot of data to query against. So one of the most uh, important aspects of uh, analytics is real time, or near real time. Um, so with the data from all 22 hospital systems, Go Health and the uh, physician groups flow into HealthShare, um, data gets de deduplicated and um, the, uh, aggregated and instantaneously becomes available for analytics. So analytics only minutes behind. And uh, we collected some of the statistics for uh, these four days. As you can see, there are over 300,000 patients flow into analytics with over 100,000 updates. And these updates can be as small as few allergies or can be as big as the entire patient record. And this is a very important thing that, that's worth mentioning. It's to uh, control the access to the PHI. You don't want to have the unauthorized access to um, the protected data here. So what the team did was they, they used the role-based access control, which is native in Iris, and they, they created a series of views, SQL views. Um, so the analysts are assigned to the roles if they're authorized. Uh, select permission of the views is granted to the roles, and the, uh, <clears throat> the access of the base tables strictly locked down, locked down. You can't access them. And the assignments of the roles are automated with uh, scripts running in the background. So there's no manual work here. So here's the list of some of the predefined roles to give you a sense of the, uh, this type of a granular security control here. 
The other thing that's very important um, is that you always want to have the latest, most up-to-date normalization in your uh, analytics output. That includes the uh, terminology cosets and mappings. So what the, the team created a iris production that runs inside the shard master that periodically receives updates, normalization updates. And they then create a, a set of views that join between these normalization tables and the base tables to provide the, uh, the up-to-date up normalization output. So there's a view for allergy, there's a view for patient, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, I just want to bring up a few query examples so that you can get a sense of uh, what type of real-life queries that the team had to work with on a daily basis. So this, this query is about comorbidity study. Uh, I don't know if you can read all that text. So this basically is a series of subqueries uh, that joins between the diagnosis table and the uh, and, uh, comorbidity reference table to identify any indication of patient's comorbidity, including uh, diabetic, um, CHFs, COPD, and all that, all that stuff. The, the, and the query returns 20,000 rows in just about over a minute. And the diagnosis table, as you can tell, that it's quite big. And this query is quite interesting. There's a Power BI dashboard that displays patients within a certain age group uh, who are eligible to enter the program for liver transplant based on some other rules from their diagnosis codes, medication, um, and it's based on this query. This query pulls data from encounter, from patient, from observation. Does somebody still remember how big the observation table is? That's like two point some billion rows. Um, and diagnosis, of course. And uh, if you look at the query plan, you can see that some of the, it's hitting all the necessary indexes, including the uh, result time and the test item code. And it finds one candidate within just about 12 seconds. So this one is my favorite query. This is to find COVID reinfection candidates. Uh, it's to find patients that have tested positive and then negative and then positive for the second time in the past 90 days. So it's basically uh, the query was constructed with self-joins between the lab result item table itself. The first self-join is to find the positive, then negative. And then you do another self-join to find the second positive. And here you go, it finds some of these candidates just about uh, under 10 seconds. And Lab result item table is about well, 1.6 billion rows. A self join between that table, the humongous table three times, and get the, get the result within 10 seconds is, is quite remarkable. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gear and bring up the, um, my guest speaker, Kyle Baxter, and he's gonna take you guys into a deeper dive of the um, sharding architecture as well as some of the tips and tricks. Uh, from this uh, SQL optimization from this migration project. All right. So while we're getting Kyle on the call, a um, few things like I would add. The example of the liver transplant you saw, I was just discussing the similar kind of issue. So usually when you want to identify a patient qualified for like a program or anything, all of that happens usually for like real-time events. So if the patient is coming into the hospital, you can identify an ADT or lab or result and then take an action onto that. But in this case, the patient is being qualified for a liver transplant just because of an age, which means the patient might not even have been in our system or never showed up at Northwell in like last three years. But today, he could have become qualified for a transplant program or something. So health inside based queries helped us a lot to identify such of the use cases, like which we cannot cover based on the real time transactions, but we cover them based on the health inside queries or the iris based queries. So that was a very, very helpful scenario. And specifically all the queries uh, which we built for our COVID use cases 
those were um, very helpful as well. In some of the cases, we were using these iris-based queries to um, track like real-time dashboard, even track our uh, bed status, like how many beds are empty and how many beds are occupied in those critical times. So it was a uh, pretty interesting, you know, leverage iris for to solving those problems. And up to, you know, there were problems, and as Simon mentioned, they worked with us. Um, most of the developers who were writing queries, they were coming from the SQL Server background. They were still not aware, like, how to identify the proper type of indexes in cache and, you know, or iris-based technologies and how to use that. And definitely InterSystems helped us a lot to cover those gaps, taught us how to um, write the queries properly, increase the performance. Some of them were like, some of them were running overnight and still never come back with the results. And you know, they brought it down to like minutes and seconds. So that, that's the power of the iris, especially with the sharded environment. So in our environment, what we have is, uh, we have four shards and one master and one of the things what it also did, and I have uh, one of our system administrator here, we have a, a standard health inside environment as well, which is, you can imagine, like six terabytes of a single, single file. It was a nightmare to take the backup. It was a nightmare to maintain it. You know, anytime, if you need to backup, do maintenance, any upgrades or anything, it was, it was very painful. But splitting into multiple shards, that has also, like, overcome those problems. It, it definitely didn't bring it down. It's still like you know a terabyte or two terabyte of a size of a file. It's still big. We're working on it to split it and see. But um, with the sharded environment, that's one of the other beauties what we have seen. The way the sharded environment is set up, it's set up with uh, ECP in some configuration. So the normalization data, which uh, Simon mentioned, and I was hearing the uh, Haltix talk earlier, they have like similar kind of implementation where they store the data in, in the health insight, which is already normalized, correct? That's, that's the case. In our case, we went into a different approach, which is because we do keep changing our normalization. Sometimes like we decide that the codes, uh, the way they are normalized, they need to be normalized differently. And also sometimes we find new codes at that point of time, rather than replaying, reformatting, all the data, we were using the um, on-demand normalization, which in SQL Server it kind of failed. And then um, when we were moving into Iris, that was one of our uh, biggest benchmark for the performance. And that, you know, I would say like that that worked pretty pretty well. So at this point of the time, the normalization is like just as a terminology. Uh, database. It just on, sits on a one master node, and all the shards, when they need to provide the data, at that point of time, they use ECP. They can look at the master and um, get the information, what code needs to be normalized to what uh, other codes. And we can do it in either direction and provide it to the users when needed. We have been even looking into some of the use cases, not yet finalized, that we could use this uh, Iris data to feed our fire servers. So we are working towards setting up the fire repository. And one of the biggest challenges is like, yeah, of course, you know, everything which you will feed in future, you could think about, you could set up your data, you could set up your pipelines and everything. But um, how do we take care of the historical data, what we have of like last 10 years? Somehow that also need to be fed to the fire repository. And we have been looking into the direction that, you know, if we can leverage uh, this sharded iris environment for that, because it has all that data, um, it's already parsed, we can just apply the normalization, convert it to one way or another into like fire resources and feed into. All right, it's all yours now, Kyle. Excellent, wonderful, great, excellent. Hi, everybody. You can hear me and maybe see me now, or maybe you could for a while. Uh, so you got to meet my dog. Um, I heard a no there. Hi, a no. Uh, so great to, uh, I would say see y'all, but I can't see any of you. Uh, you can see me though and hear me, I hope. Um, wish I could be there, but my wife is like 38 weeks pregnant. So we are, uh, go time at any time. And I thought being, uh, across the country was, uh, sort of 
probably unwise if I wanted to see the birth of my daughter. Uh, very excited. Um, so Simon says you can hear me. Guys, just if you can hear me, please, hands up. Yo, I just said I can't see you. Who put their hand up? Someone did. I saw you. Can't lie to me. I don't know where I am compared to you guys. All right. Great. So now that I have built the perfect rapport with everyone, that's why they like me to do these things, uh, we're going to get into some of the content here. I'm going to talk about um, sharding, specifically how Northwell has implemented sharding. Um, we, uh, I, I, I heard a nil talking when I got in here, so I'm sure he's told you lots of stuff. Uh, that dude is, he is real good. Uh, and that's coming from me. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to do just a little quick overview of what sharding is. Uh, technically, I'm going to talk about how to design uh, sharded tables. Uh, we're going to talk about how we use views and how really useful they are in a sharded environment. Uh, and um, then we're going to talk just very briefly about permissions. We're going to talk a little bit about reading query plans, and we're going to talk about the big pothole that is subqueries. Um, and a little bit of why that needs to have its own little portion here. Um, usually when I go through these things, I tell people to stop me if you can't understand me. All right, I know I speak with an accent. I know I speak very quickly. I don't have a chance. I know I have a tendency to mumble. Um, unfortunately, none of you can stop me today because I can't see you. Uh, so if you really feel like you need to stop me, uh, tell Simon. Simon uh, will hopefully be able to do it. Um, and if not, uh, well, then this is going to be... Uh, a little bit chaotic, but on we go. So let's talk about sharding um, a little bit. There uh, we go. So this is a typical sharding setup, right? What you see here is a uh, four shard environment. We have uh, one shard that has the uncharted tables, and then we have uh, three other shards which just have their portion of uh, the sharded tables. Shard one also has a portion of the sharded tables. Um, well, my slides have gotten screwed up, but we move on. Um, all shards communicate with each other uh, via ECP. ECP is the uh, protocol um, that is used for shards to communicate with each other. It is uh, an old intersystems protocol. Uh, and by old, I mean that in the way that it is battle tested and it works. It is it's not something that they finished and like left off to the side. I know it's it, you know, at least last I was there a couple of years ago, but it was still in constant development being improved. Uh, so it's a very efficient communication protocol between iris instances. Um, uncharted tables live on one shard. Um, usually we I call that shard one. Um, and uh, each shard, including shard one, holds one nth of your data, or if you have n shards. Um, so if we have a shard table name like kyle.table, uh, don't call your tables table. That's really dumb. Um, you will also have something called a shard local table that will have, by default, this iris shard and then your table name. Um, this is important to know because when you're debugging queries, it can be really useful to pop onto one shard to do some of your debugging. Um, this is really good for, um, uh, drilling down into problems the way you, you, you frequently want to do. Um, the, when we're solving for performance problems, it can, it can be useful to take the, the query that you run on the shards, run on the shards and see how it performs. And you can look at a, a kind of a simpler version of a query plan, which I'll get into a little bit more later. Um, should I have taken these shards and put them in a grid uh, instead of uh, in a line where I had to make these fancy lines? Yes, obviously, let's move on. So uh, here is, uh, as far as I could tell, the list of sharded tables in our environment. Um, I want you guys to take a second and think of which one do you think is the most important based on this whole list. Uh, don't answer. I can't hear you. Did you think it was patient? Uh, so for those of you who are, are familiar with healthcare environments, good chance you were thinking of encounter, right? Everything is encounter based uh, in, in health share, right? It's, it's, it's just how things work. Um, but it turns out, um, for us, patient was more important. And this is one of the really great times where the, the, the business, the way you talk about the business really can um, work in tandem with the way that the technology works, right? We want to be patient-centric, right? I think every hospital does. I don't think that's special to Northwell. Um, but in doing so, uh, our technology and in the iris technology were able to keep things patient centric in a way uh, that also 
uh, lets our SQL performance get to another level. So when you're designing tables in your sharded environment, um, it, it matters how you decide to break your tables up. Um, I mean, table design has always mattered, of course, but if you're going to be using tables together, very specifically, if you're joining tables together, you want them to be in the same shard, uh, in the same way, so that the queries can perform better, right? This is called co-sharding. Um, when you're thinking about joining tables, right, all of your other concerns still matter, and this is just another thing you have to think about. And this is a bit of what sharding is when you start implementing it, right? It is thinking about SQL with just an extra step. There's a little bit more you have to be concerned about. All right. So uh, I want to go a little bit into co-sharding because this is a, a, a very important topic. It's the uh, it, it's the design topic, right? I'm, I'm an architect. I'm, I'm into the design stuff. And designing it right helps you get it right. Um, so, uh, I have a, uh, I have a statement here that, uh, deciding how to approach sharding is step three and having good performance. Um, steps one and two, think of them, think of them, index and tune table, right? The stuff all still plays, right? You don't get to just ignore, uh, what would be a, a normal good, um, uh, uh, good, your, your good habits from designing tables, right? Just cause it's sharded. Um, so uh, why why is co-sharding so important that I'm putting it in with putting in indexes and having data for the optimizer to pick good plans from, right? These two things are, you know, when it comes to uh, in a in a one node environment, optimizing performance, these are the two biggest things. And in a sharding, this is on that level. Um, so suppose, right, this is a bit of a thought exercise, so bear with me, right? We have a query like this. Uh, table one and table two are both sharded over this two shard system, uh, which means I have to draw less lines. So that works for me. Uh, what happens if we're running this query, right? So let's, you know, let's just, let's just in our heads run the query, right? Okay, we'll start on table one uh, because it sort of hardly matters how we do this because we're going to be reading each of these tables. Um, and if we read table one, we can read it in order and that feels pretty good. So we read table one. We get the ID, we get the first row, we get the ID. We have to go look up the reference from table two. So that is how joins work great. But this is a sharded table. So it's gonna be happening on two shards at the same time. So on shard one, it grabs its first ID for this table and wants to go look up the second, the the corresponding row from table two. Well, if it's on the same shard, great. We just go get it. It's a normal join. But if it's on the other shard, it might have to go pull that row over. Right? So now it pulls that row over to do its join. Goes, gets the next ID. Eh, maybe that's on this one. The next one might have to pull it over. Right? In general, the first shard is going to have to pull over half the rows from table two over to itself to be able to execute the join. But on shard two, the same thing is happening in reverse it needs all the rows that shard one has. So what you end up doing is you're sending all of table two across your network, right? This is pretty bad. Um, you know, a network is very much like a slow disk. Um, if this was even in a more complicated situations, right? This obviously very silly query, right? You don't select star isn't a good enterprise query, right? What are we doing with this? But even in good queries where you're actually restricting data, you could be sending lots of data across your network and hitting bandwidth limits that restricts how fast these queries can operate. Right? So if we had made these um, two tables co-sharded in a way, we wouldn't have to do this. So uh, a little more about co-sharding. Co-sharding only makes sense uh, when you talk about uh, tables and a query. Um, if, if Aviel is there, I'm sure he is like itching to say that. Um, and if he's there, hi Aviel. Uh, when you, uh, when you, so co-sharding doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to say in general two tables are co-sharded um, without having queries under which they are co-sharded. Um, here's an example. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the query I just said, if um, 
you know, uh, sharding has something called a shard key, which is how you determine which row goes onto which shard. And if we say, hey, this table one reference is our shard key, it will shard the same way that table one does. And then this query uh, will be co-sharded. That means when we are joining these two tables together, we never have to go across the network to pluck a row from another shard. This is a very similar query, but under the same situation, uh, that won't be co-sharded. It will have to take all a table two across the network, right? So uh, th th this, ends up, this ends up being very important the, the more you, you dig into this. Um, so for that reason, um, you need to kind of have an idea for how your tables are going to fit together and what kind of queries are going to run and what you sort of expect people to do with your data. Now, you know, they say that no, um, uh, no good plan survives its first encounter with the enemy. Well, no good piece of code survives its first encounter with an end user. Uh, we all know that. Um, but you really, uh, it, in our case, it's not too hard to think about, right? And in the hospital case, it's sort of not, right? Because this is this is health insight, right? We want information about what's going on. We want information about patients, right? We want, um, you know, we want to know the diabetics and, and information about them. Well, that's, you know, that's an example that um, uh, Simon gave earlier, right? Well, those are patients. So for that, we know we want to ask questions about patients. So we co-shard everything on patient, everything. So whatever you want to know about patients, uh, queries can be run in one shard without having to reach out to other shards and pluck data on. Uh-oh. Things are falling in my house. Um, yeah, we just move on. Cass, are you okay? My dog's okay. We're good. All right. Um, so this is a little bit more um, about co-sharding and why it's important to... Uh, have your queries written properly. So I talked about this a little bit, right? This for us is very specifically a co-sharded query. Here's a co-sharded query and here's a non-co-sharded query. So you see two queries here. These are very reasonable queries. Um, they aren't necessarily this simple. Um, I'm, I'm sure Anil is here being like, they don't look like that. Anil, you're right. But for the purpose of argument, um, both of these are perfectly reasonable ways to write uh, your queries against our tables. But the first query, that is that is written with our co-sharding in mind will perform lightning fast while this while the second one with the MRNs won't because again we're sending lots of data across the network we don't want to do that right so our our non-co-sharded joins uh, there's a word for them uh, Ben Debo knows it I, I couldn't remember it um, because they are bad uh, for the, the sort of network congestion it causes. Um, we decided to implement views. Now what views do for us is it allows us to basically control our query writers, right? We have query writers who aren't experts in our technology, right? In fact, a lot of our query writers are, are more familiar with SQL Server where we used to have the data. So if we want to control how they implement their joins, we do this with views. We just created a bunch of views um, and said query on the views. Um, this was a huge benefit for us. Huge, 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 huge. Right? Because now everyone who was writing a query and being like, hey, this performs terrible, we're like, oh, yeah, do the join like this. We don't have to tell them, right? That's this, like, it basically cuts down on support calls for us, right? It's like, hey, use the views. And the views do the joins properly. They do the joins under our co sharding architecture. Um, uh, it's also uh, enforceable with permissions that you can give your user permission on your views and not on your tables, so they have to use your views, right? Again, this is pretty nice. This is something that, you know, as opposed to having to train people on and letting people make mistakes, and, you know, I've, I've long said that you can, you know, you can do a lot of damage with a bad query, right? And you can gobble up your system resources. You have to be careful. This is a really easy way for us to be careful with this stuff. Um, speaking of permissions, and this was a headache for us for a little while, um, when you are granting permissions in a sharded environment, you need to grant permissions on the sharded table, right? For us, it'd be something like HSA.patient and the shard local table definition on all the shards, right? The Irish shard stuff, right? That has to go too. Um, 
views uh, have something called an owner. The person who creates a view becomes the view's owner, and the view owner needs to have permission on the tables and the sharded local tables. Um, there, uh, th there are some useful tricks that we have implemented on doing this. Um, you can grant permissions on a per schema basis. Uh, that's really useful for um, granting permissions for tables that don't exist yet. Um, it's one of the only ways that Iris allows you to grant permission on a table that doesn't exist at the time when you write the grant statement. Um, another way to do this, uh, and this was, uh, you know, with some of our, our wonderful platform team, with the idea to just add grant statements to our delegated authentication routine. So that when you log in, you're given, you're given your grants each time. Um, this is, uh, a grant statements run super, super, super fast. It's just a couple of global sets, right? This, this works really well. Um, great. So let's talk about reading query plans. Um, this is a sort of, this is a, a, a query plan I have ripped off of our system. Uh, if you're like Kyle, that query's dumb. Correct, it is. But we're talking about reading the plan, so it doesn't really matter what the query is doing, right? This is what you'll see when you look at a query plan. You'll see distribute query to shard servers and then all the, the stuff we're going to distribute. Okay. So you scroll down, you scroll down your query plan, and you see something like this process query in parallel, partitioning data into da da da. da. Okay, you scroll down, you scroll down, you scroll down, and then you see this. Well, this is what you want, right? This is this is what you're used to, right? When you're looking at this, when you're looking at sharded query plans, you want to come down to this, and I've called this earlier in the presentation a uh, a shard local uh, def, uh, the shard local tape the shard local query, right? This is the thing you want to optimize. Um, you optimize it. Uh, in the way you op you're used to optimizing queries, right? You guys are used to adding indexes and looking at clauses and figuring out, you know, how to get the join order right, right? That stuff all plays down here, right? Just fine, provided your co-sharding is correct and your query is correct to work with your co-sharding. Um, the, the big thing you want to make sure you see is something like this, right? Where you see um, the, uh, hopefully you guys can see the, the cursor. Uh, if you can't, don't tell me, I don't care. Uh, if you see um, distribute query to shard servers, read temp file, output the row. What that means is all the work is being done on the shards. You want that. If you're doing lots and lots of work on the shard you're running the query against, uh, you have ruined the purpose of sharding, right? You want work to be done in the shards. That's how you're getting your distributed work done, right? If you're doing it all, uh, if you're doing it all on this shard, you're ruined the point, right? So make sure um work is being done in the shards right once you're there uh you do your normal optimizations your stuff you're all very used to um beware of your use of system resources uh i'm going to talk a little bit more about that later but i but I, I will slide back for a second and let you know that this one query sent a query to each shard right this four right now is four queries running and those are all parallelized so those could be running four jobs, eight jobs, right? So this is one query that could have kicked off 32 jobs, right? Something you have to keep in mind when you're when you're designing and when you're running queries. Um, and uh, I have now a question about work that doesn't show up in the plan. I was going to have a thing with this, but Simon told me to speed up. So baby, we going. All right. Uh, here's just a little thing to consider. Uh, very, very quickly, this is a uh, sharded table that just has a few fields. I have a stored procedure that adds the namespace uh, onto whatever you give it, and I've inserted one row. Uh, this uh, sharded thing, this sharded system that I have, this is on my local computer. It has three namespaces. Uh, MAS, I run queries on MAS and only on MAS. Um, MAS stands for master. Um, it's not really how you should set these things up, but it's how I set it up for uh, my purposes for debugging. And then I have two shards. Great. So look at this, right? Remember, right? So we're just going to send in a row from the table, pass it into the store procedure. Uh, what do you expect to get here? Um, I will tell you that the data does not, uh, I'm running the query in MAS, the data does not live there. I think it lives, it lives in um, SH2. So think about it for a sec. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Boom, right? It actually gets run on the shard master, uh, the master, right? Where the 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 shard that I'm running the query on, the aggregator, if you will, right? So about this, right? Does this work? I mean, obviously not, right? I'm I'm setting it up for that. 
you had to get the payoff, right? So it, very, very importantly, query plans do not tell you where functions are run. And as far as I can tell, if you put a function in the select clause, it gets run on the query, um, sorry, it gets run on the shard that you ran the query on, all right? If you put it in the where clause, those will run on the individual shards. Now, why does this matter, right? Simon told you about some of the normalization work we did. Uh, we had a lot of work. Uh, if I, I worked with, uh, with Nick Chimera, this, if Nick's there, then Nick, put your hand up. Just kidding, can't see you. Um, the uh, One of the big things that we found is we were trying to join in a, a table that did these normalizations for us. And we found that that was kind of slow because we were joining in on rows that we didn't need to join in on. And in fact, doing the normalization uh, ended up would have been faster if we just did it at the very, very, very end. Um, so what we did is we implemented some store procedures. Um, and the store procedures were able to do the lookup very quickly on a very small number of rows, right? So as opposed to, you know, bringing in this table, and you, we sometimes have to bring it in twice because the way some of our queries are written. Um, you know, these store procedures allowed us to uh, change where work was done uh, and change when work was done. Yeah, this was very powerful for us. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm just going to keep plowing on. Uh, let's talk about subqueries for a minute. Um, subqueries rock. Uh, it's one of the really good uh, things about SQL. I think SQL's got a lot of good things going for it. But subqueries let you basically break a problem down. Right? You solve one problem, pop it in a subquery, and just pop that back into your big query, into your, um, your, your, your overall query, right? In your bigger query. Um, it's a really good way to break problems down um and in sql server uh they love subqueries oh baby um subqueries are are often a way to get around having to think about having to do a join or, or some complicated join situations um and the good thing is the optimizer will just figure it out for you right that's true in iris it's true for for most uh flavors of sql um if you have a subquery that could be a join it just figures it out for you no big deal um but um in a sharded environment, these are quite obviously uh, more complicated, as sort of everything is more complicated, uh, but in ways that you might not think of. So um, sorry for the text dump on the slide, um, but I think this is the only artifact you're getting from this presentation. So what we have here is basically two types of subqueries. You have correlated subqueries, where you could very much rewrite this as a join. Um, but the idea is that you need something from the outer query in the inner query to be able to execute uh, the inner query. Right? There's a correlated subquery. Uh, the other thing you might have is non-correlated subqueries where the subquery needs to be executed apart from the main query. Right? There, there are lots of ways to do this. Um, this was sort of the easiest one I could think of. Um, everything else is very, very complicated. Um, uh, I don't want to go too much more into uh, correlated, non-correlated subqueries. Uh, we go on. So here's a non-correlated subquery, and this is a problem. Right? Why? Because we are going to execute the normal query um, in, in the normal way where we distribute queries to shard servers, but we're also going to take the subquery and distribute those to shard servers, right? So now, remember I talked earlier, right? One query to four shards, multi-threaded, 32 jobs. Now we're doing it twice. Now we have 64 jobs, right? Now all of a sudden, uh, we might have to compete for some resources, and uh, you don't want to be competing for resources. Um, so this is uh, more or less what I was just talking about. Um, the uh, uh, okay, someone else is typing to me. I hate having this up like this. Um, okay, wrap up. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks, guy. All right, uh, gotta go. So. Uh, be careful with that. Uh, Frank is somewhere in the audience. Frank, I know, did a lot of work on on how we dealt with uh, that stuff. So what do we want to know with well? Um, sharding on Iris outperformed our old SQL Server setup vastly, immensely. Uh, it was, it's doing really well. Uh, you should design your tables well. Simon, I know, did a lot with this. Uh, so did Neil, who again is in the crowd somewhere. Um, there was a, a lot of work to get these designed correctly, and that's super, super, super important. Um, you can use views to control how your users are joining your tables to make sure they are doing it under your co-sharding setup. That is very important. 
Um, you can make very clever use of store procedures to control where work is done and when work is done. Um, and you need to be super, super careful around non-correlated subqueries. Sorry I had to rush so much. Uh, this isn't as fast as I talked, but it's pretty close. Uh, any questions? Uh, I would love to take them, but again, I can't hear you. So uh, ask Simon. Uh, or better yet, ask Anil uh, or Nick or Frank. Hopefully they're in the audience. Uh, and if you're thinking, man, Kyle, we love you. I'd love to buy you a beer. Buy one of those guys a beer. Those guys rule. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, you, you know, feel free to ask. Um, we, unfortunately, we, we don't have much time left <laughs> during our session, but you can always find me, simon.shaw and intersystems.com. Um, directly send me questions. I'll hand around outside. If you have questions, just come talk to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to hear your use cases. And uh, if you have specific use cases, you can always engage your account team and uh, we'll fully support sharding. And as, as you saw, it's um, the Formula One E4. Yeah, sure. I am curious as to whether, did you start with the decision as to how many shards and, which, and how to set them up, or did it start with the queries first? Were you looking at the queries and then from the ground up saying, this is how many shards we're going to need and this is how they'll be split up, or was it the, more the other way around or both at the same time? It's a uh, very good question. It's actually, um, the design decision of four shards was actually made right at the beginning. And uh, um, we never actually went beyond that because the performance was quite good. Uh, even with all the data that's pumped in. So, but we, instead of adding more shards, we improve the queries. And towards the point where it becomes acceptable. Thank you. Any other questions? So was hardware the limitation uh, in data mining? So how did you arrive at the, at the four? Like, how did the decision come out to be four? It can be six, eight, but why four? Uh, yeah, I mean, the... Um, um, yeah, sharding is for use commodity hardware, you know, to horizontally scale, scale your uh, environments. So if you have resources, yeah, six, eight, ten. So it's all about design. And as Kyle said, design your query, design your sharding architecture, um, engage your sales engineer or the account team to get to the best combination of it. Okay. If uh, you are using, uh, if you put an API on top, uh, for example, and uh, maybe it's a web app or something calling in. Um, how does the sharding work still? Because are you coming into the master, or what are you coming into to kick off your, your query, and will you still get the sharding benefits if you're coming from the outside rather, rather than run your query insert? So, um, yeah, good question. Um, so this particular cluster uh, was the early version of the, um, the sharding architecture, um, and it the sharding architecture has been improved so that you, you can actually query the shard. You don't have, always have to go into the master as the entry point. Okay. Uh, but with that particular architecture, if you have an API calling into the master, you will have the same effect as you've just run a query straight from the um, deep beaver or something. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, you always go through a master in that particular uh, uh, architecture. Just in the interest of, uh, yeah. of getting the room changed over in the next like six minutes, um, yeah. I'm going to have you all just uh, give Mr. Shaw questions off the mic, um, if that's okay. Um, or, of course, Simon Dot Shaw at. <laughs> yeah, please send <laughs> you know, me questions uh, then. I'll be outside. Just talk to me. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.